called G.W. Leibniz, a prodigious scholar of 18th century Germany um, and the founder of the calculus, wrote the first question which should rightly be asked is why is there something rather than nothing? In other words, why does anything at all exist? This, for Leibniz, is the most fundamental question that a person can ask. Like me, Leibniz came to the conclusion that the answer is to be found not in the universe of created things, but in God. God exists necessarily and is the explanation why anything else exists. We can put Leibniz's thinking into the form of a simple argument. This has the advantage of making his logic very clear and focusing our attention on the central steps of his reasoning. And it also serves to make his argument very easy to memorize. There are basically three steps or premises in Leibniz's reasoning. Number one, everything that, be, uh, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence. Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence. Two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. And three, the universe exists. That's it. Now, what follows logically from these three premises? Well, look at premises one and three. If everything that exists has an explanation of its existence and the universe exists, then it follows logically that four, therefore the universe has an explanation of its existence. Now notice that premise two says that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. And we've seen in premise four, or step four, that the universe has an explanation of its existence. And so from two and four, it logically follows that therefore the explanation of the universe's existence is God. Now, this is a logically airtight argument. That is to say, if the three premises are true, then the conclusion is unavoidable. It doesn't matter if you don't like the conclusion. It doesn't matter if you have other objections to God's existence. So long as you grant the premises, you have to accept the conclusion. So, if anyone wants to uh, reject the conclusion, he has to say that one of the three premises is false. But which one will he reject? Premise three, that the universe exists, I think is indisputable for anyone who is a sincere inquirer after truth. Obviously, the universe exists. So the argument's detractor is going to have to deny either one or two if he wants to remain an atheist and be rational. So the whole question comes down to this. Are premises one and two true or are they false? Well, let's look at them. At first blush, premise one seems vulnerable to an obvious objection. If everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, and God exists, then God must have an explanation of his existence. But that seems absurd, for then the explanation of God's existence would have to be some other being greater than God. But since that's impossible, premise one must be false. Some things must be able to exist without any explanation. The theist will say that God exists inexplicably. The atheist will say, why, why not just stop with the universe? The universe just exists inexplicably. So we seem to reach a stalemate. Well, not so fast. This obvious objection to premise one is based on a misunderstanding of what Leibniz meant by an explanation. 
In Leibniz's view, there are two kinds of things. A, things that exist necessarily, and B, things which are produced by some external cause. Let me explain. Things which exist necessarily exist by a necessity of their own nature. It's impossible for them not to exist. Many mathematicians think that numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects exist in this way. They're not caused to exist by something else. They just exist by the necessity of their own nature. By contrast, things that are caused to exist by something else don't exist necessarily. They exist because something else has produced them. Familiar physical objects like people, planets, and galaxies belong to this category. So, when Leibniz says that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, that explanation may be found either in the necessity of a thing's own nature or else in some external cause. So, premise one could be revised in the following way. One star, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. But now the objection falls to the ground. For the explanation of God's existence lies in the necessity of his own nature. As even the atheist recognizes, it's impossible for God to have a cause. So Leibniz's argument is really an argument for God as a necessary, uncaused being. Far from undermining Leibniz's argument, the atheist's objection to premise one actually helps to clarify and magnify who God is. If God exists, then he is a necessarily existing, uncaused being. So, what reason might be offered for thinking that premise one is true? Well, when you reflect on it, premise one has a sort of self-evidence about it. Imagine that you're walking through the woods and you come upon a translucent ball lying on the forest floor. You would automatically wonder how it came to be there. If one of your hiking partners said to you, don't worry about it, it just exists inexplicably, you'd either think that he was crazy or you figured that he just wanted you to keep on moving. No one would take seriously the suggestion that the ball existed there with literally no explanation. Now, suppose you increase the size of the ball in this story so that it's the size of a car. That wouldn't do anything to remove or to satisfy the demand for an explanation. Suppose it were the size of a house same problem. Suppose it were the size of a continent or a planet. Same problem. Suppose it were the size of the entire universe. Same problem. Merely increasing the size of the ball does nothing to affect the need of an explanation. Now, sometimes atheists will say that premise one is true of everything in the universe, but is not true of the universe itself. Everything in the universe has an explanation, but the universe itself has no explanation. But this response commits what has aptly been called the taxicab uh, fallacy. As the 19th century uh, atheist philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer quipped, premise one can't be dismissed like a hack once you've arrived at your desired destination. You can't say that everything has an explanation of its existence and then suddenly exempt the universe. It would be arbitrary for the atheist to claim that the universe is the exception to the rule. Recall that Leibniz does not make God an exception to uh, premise one. Our illustration of the ball in the woods showed that merely increasing the size of the ball 
even until it becomes uh, coextensive with the entire universe, does nothing to remove the need for some explanation of its existence. Notice, too, how unscientific this atheist response is. For modern cosmology, the study of the large-scale structure of the universe, is devoted to a search for an explanation of the universe's existence. The atheist attitude would cripple science. So, some atheists have tried to justify 